Okay, let's talk uh, a little bit about interpreting um, epistles. And um, let me just see what your experience has been. Uh, in the teaching that you have heard uh, since you've been a believer, what uh, percentage of it would you say has been from the epistles? Just think about that. Is it, is it a high percentage or is it a low percentage? Really high. Yeah. Really high? That was certainly my experience for a lot of years. Uh, especially as I got into church, churches that were a little more focused on really teaching the scriptures that, uh, yeah, it seems like uh, we almost never got out of the epistles. And a lot of my training and my uh, first uh, seminary training, uh, the courses we did on preaching and exegesis were centered in the epistles. And we never uh, really did a, a preaching course or anything that had to do with the gospels, which in retrospect is rather shocking to me, and let alone the whole Old Testament. But uh, yeah, so is it fair to say this is an area that most of you have pretty grounded in, have had a lot of time and experience. So, well, that uh, being the case, then uh, we would like to um, remedy that a bit and uh, would like to talk about how to deal with the, uh, the epistles. And uh, I'm going to be on page 65. We'll start there and uh, look at some of the surrounding areas of that. And we'll spend a little time on the epistles, also uh, on next to class, and uh, talk about a very important passage and kind of look at that in terms of uh, uh, its uh, significance to life and ministry. So uh, let me encourage you to be here next Tuesday uh, as we look at uh, Ephesians 4, 1 through 16 and uh, particularly the concept of, of equipping the saints. And uh, that's a drum. You may know that I love to bang, and so I'm going to bang it quite loudly next, uh, next Tuesday. And uh, I think for those of you that are getting training here, I hope that you'll see the end of it is not just for your benefit, but that uh, God's people and, and those beyond will really, really benefit from that. So. That's what we'll be talking about next week. Okay, so on page 65, I want to just touch on these. Uh, in terms of reading the epistles well and interpreting them well, so that it ends up impacting you and uh, those uh, to whom you will be privileged to teach, uh, the uh, first point, and you probably uh, have come to expect this, is to read the epistle in one sitting to get the big idea of the letter and its main contours. Read it in one sitting. Now the good news is with epistles, most of them are shorter. <laughs> so this is uh, a lot easier, isn't it? To read the whole thing. And um, I'm just curious, uh, how many of you did the Philippians 1, 3 through 11, this passage? Okay, just curious, I'm, I'm not gonna hold it against you. How many of you uh, in starting that paper read uh, the whole letter of, the, of Philippians? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, a few of you. All right. Well, I'm going to redouble my efforts here then to emphasize uh, this sort of, uh, of a, a methodology. Read the whole letter and see how your passage fits into it. Now, remember, uh, the literacy rate was 5 to 10 percent in the Roman Empire, and so these letters were written to be read in the assembly. And so the vast, vast, vast majority of people will access them through hearing them read. So there is some sense of then how they function for most people uh, as, a, as a sermon or as a speech. Uh, and so uh, things at the beginning, once you get past the greeting, are immensely important in terms of orienting people to the rest of the letter or to this, uh, essentially this uh, talk, this speech, this sermon from the Apostle Paul. So you, you, want, to, you want to get that panoramic sense of it 
And again, there's something, even if you just read it out loud to yourself, there's something about hearing it read that, 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 that really is powerful. And you will, you will probably get closer to grasping the nature of the thing and the, and the way it was meant to be communicated as you do that. So I, I really highly recommend that to you. It's just a, it's a powerful experience. Either to listen to it on tape or if that's not accessible, read it, read it to yourself. Get that panoramic sense of it. Okay. Now, in uh, the Greco-Roman world, we have discovered thousands and thousands and thousands of letters uh, from uh, before the time of Christ and up through the time of Christ. And uh, we found them in an ancient uh, trash dump uh, in Egypt. And uh, they were written, of course, on uh, uh, papyrus, a materi organic material, which normally it would deteriorate pretty quickly, but uh, those sands uh, in this uh, trash dump in uh, Egypt were so dry they, uh, that uh, there was not uh, much uh, you know, decay on this. And so this is in the late 1800s, and we call those the papyri, and, and then we have multi-volume you know, works that recount uh, all of uh, these documents. And so we have found every imaginable kind of letter in the ancient world, uh, not just ones that would relate uh, to uh, Christianity, but uh, far, far, far beyond that. So of all the, the genres of the New Testament, this one we know a lot about. And uh, we have even some of the ancient uh, textbooks written uh, by Greek and Roman uh, folks to teach how to write different kinds of letters. Uh, so that was such an important uh, kind of communication. So it's a, a genre that we really are, uh, we really richly understand. Uh, and uh, now with a revived emphasis in rhetorical studies, uh, we, we focus not only on the, the structure of letters, but now with the use of rhetoric, we focus on the flow of the argument of those letters within the epistolary structure. And so it's a both and. We're looking at form, the, the forms of a letter, but we're also looking at the function, the argumentation of it. And in fact, in a lot of ways, that's more, really more fruitful uh, as to understanding what's going on. So, uh, very important, and we've got a lot of good, uh, you know, resources in this area to draw from. So, the a second thing, of course, is to think in terms of paragraphs. Of all the genres that you get uh, a payback for thinking in terms of paragraph, this is really uh, the key genre. A and again, the breaks in a thought, the paragraph breaks, obviously weren't in the original text, uh, neither were words or sentences. They were just, they were in, you know, capital letters just uh, all the way through. So the eye and, and the mind have to uh, break them into words and sentences and paragraphs. And, and so, uh, in this case, in the New Testament, uh, the uh, paragraph breaks are established by the uh, Greek scholars who study the texts and that, and uh, see them grammatically and uh, thematically, these are where the breaks occur. And so uh, it's to our benefit in interpreting them really to follow those breaks. And uh, if you're using a version of the New Testament that doesn't have those, that breaks down paragraphs into a lot of smaller chunks just to kind of be more reader friendly, again, there's value in having a literal translation that tends to follow, in this case, the Greek New Testament and its paragraphing, and just Mark uh, your Bible, if you like to read this one that doesn't, you know, follow the literal paragraphing, just, just mark the paragraphs uh, in your Bible. Just, you know, have a little, some kind of code, and my wife does that. And um, that, that will give you just a, a, a both and in sense, to be able to think in terms of whole units of thought. So just, uh, again, I, I can't emphasize that enough. And uh, one of the disappointments of uh, the uh, 1995 uh, kind of revision of the New American Standard uh, is that they played somewhat fast and loose with the paragraphing. 
And uh, I had a chat with some of the folks uh, that the foundation that um, sponsored that. And uh, I said, boy, uh, kind of sorry you did that. I wish you'd have asked me. That was a pretty big uh, hermeneutic. That was pretty important to, uh, to kind of disregard that. So that's, that's what happens sometimes. OK, here we go. Knowing the structure of the epistles uh, also helps you know where you are in the letter. Now again, it's the, it's the, these were written to be read and only a few people saw them, or written to be read to the assembly, so most people will hear them, but those who could see them uh, and those who knew the parts of the letter would know when there were transitions going on uh, in the letter. And uh, so we want to, uh, since we're privileged to be able to see these letters and, and, and to read them, then uh, it's important uh, for us to know the basic you know, structure of letters. And so, again, of the thousands and thousands of letters that we found in the Greco-Roman world, they uh, follow a, a, a rather common pattern that is, uh, at least in Western culture, is a, is a pattern we use today, isn't it? Where you have an introduction, and this makes a lot more sense than the way we do it in this country. In the introduction, the first word of a letter is normally the author's name. For some reason, we put the author's name at the end of the letter, generally, don't we? Uh, and of course, you've probably never read a letter in your life and waited till the end to see who it was from, have you? you just, we don't do that. So you look at the return address, or you turn it over and look at the back and whatever. But they started with uh, the writer's name, the recipients, and then greetings. And, and so a letter could be uh, as short as three words. The author's name, uh, to the recipients in the dative case, and that could be, you know, one word, and, uh, you know, to the Philippians could be one word, and then the Greek word kairain, which simply means greetings. So uh, a lot of the letters, extra biblical letters, are that, that concise in the beginning. Now, Paul generally will expand that a bit in his letters, as do some of the other uh, letter writers in the New Testament, to a, a sentence or two, a verse or two. And in Galatians, he extends it to uh, five verses. And in Romans, his longest one is seven verses. Now, all he has to say is, Paul, to the Romans, hello. <laughs> but in those seven verses, he's really off to the races already, isn't he? So uh, that's, it would be instructive when someone, an author, would expand an introduction. Then, of course, the main part of the letter is the body, uh, where the writer gives plans, thinking, main issues, primary focus in that, and then a closing. And lots of things in the closing. Greetings to others, warnings, benedictions, instructions, all kinds of things could, uh, could get you know, put in there. Now, here's how Paul and his letters in particular modifies it, and this is uh, with our color and our lights on. <laughs> this is, uh, it, it knocks out my, uh, my coloration here. That's kind of strange. Uh, but Paul puts in, the, the top one is he puts in a Thanksgiving section uh, right after the greeting. And in most of his letters, Galatians, he doesn't put a Thanksgiving in, he puts a rebuke in. <laughs> so he says, hello, Boom, and then he rebukes them. I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting him who called you by his grace. You know, that's a great way to start a letter, isn't it? Boom. Uh, he jumps right in, in their face. But normally in Paul's letter, he would have a Thanksgiving section right after the introduction, and we'll see that in Philippians 1, 3 through 11. And, uh, and again, uh, thinking about connecting with uh, these house churches in the city into whom he's writing. Uh, there would be uh, finding some quality about them and their community uh, for which to thank God for. And uh, for some churches, like the Corinthians, he probably had to scratch around for a little while on that. Corinthians were pretty wild and unruly. But uh, he finally, uh, assuming he had to think about it just for a few moments, he thanks God for the fact that they are so gifted so have so many grace gifts. Now, of course, later on in the letter, he's going to say you have no idea how to use them properly to edify one another, but 
he thanks God that they've got a lot of them that they're gifted and he can do that in good conscience. And, uh, and, and so we're going to see for the Philippians, he thanks God for something very uh, specific for them. And, uh, and again, remember now in Philippians, we're going to see there's a long uh, relationship that he has with them. And uh, additionally, in many of these letters, since they're going to be read to a group of people and function as a speech or a sermon for most folks, then uh, if there's a Thanksgiving section, this generally then acts as the introduction to the letter, to give them your big idea, to thematically orient them to what you want to say. And that's what introductions of talks or sermons do, don't they? So it, it has, a, has double duty, the whole Thanksgiving section. And uh, then in many of Paul's letters, he adds a section as a, as a part of the body. Some would say it's uh, actually perhaps a different thing from the body. But generally speaking, I think most would see it as a part of the body. And that is uh, what we call a moral exhortation part, where Paul uh, shifts and becomes a bit uh, more exhortive, more challenging to them. Probably the best known one is, uh, you know, Romans 12, 1 and 2, uh, you know, where he says, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, living in sacrifice, living holy sacrifice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so uh, the, the, the cues are in the words that are used that uh, it specifically becomes more exhortive, and he will give oral clues of that. In uh, Philippians, which we're looking at today here. If I can find my Bible, okay. In Philippians, uh, the moral exhortation part actually begins in chapter 4, verse 2. So would someone uh, read chapter 4, verses 2 and 3? No, that's fine. Go ahead. Thank you. I'll let you read. Go ahead. You got it? I got it. Sure. Um, four, sorry, verses two and three? Yeah, chapter four. Okay. Um, I urge Eodia, I don't know if that's Eodia. Eodia and Syntyche, yep. Yeah, there you go, whatever you said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion. Sorry. Indeed, true companion. I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Okay. So notice we get uh, 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 suddenly a change in language, uh, and the key word would be urge, idea, exurge or exhort, and, uh, you know, it's one thing to be, uh, have your names uh, in scripture for the rest of your days <laughs> of the, till the Lord comes. Uh, but it's a whole other thing to have them in there because you couldn't get along with each other. So I guess these were a couple of important uh, women and, uh, you know, significant women with significant ministries in the life of the church and they just were having trouble getting along. And so uh, in this uh, moral exhortation part, it, 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 you know, starts with that. And then he talks about how they think and be anxious for nothing uh, and all that. So there's several different topics that uh, may be dealt with in the moral exhortation part. So these are kind of two additions that Paul adds. A Thanksgiving section where many times he and other authors lay out their big idea. And then uh, the moral exhortation part of the body where uh, he emphasizes Christian behavior. And uh, then, of course, uh, the, the closing and lots of different things can be in there. Now... The moral exhortation part is important because we are called to have faith in God to, through faith in Christ, but that initial faith and God's declaration of righteousness to us is just the beginning, isn't it? The faith uh, is so that we can be faithful and it, 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 it opens up a lifetime ideally of faith giving way to faithfulness or to obedience and uh, it's really uh, interesting how uh, the New Testament and the Old Testament understands that it's, it's always a both and uh, 
you know, James says, how can you have faith without works or, or, or obedience? And uh, sometimes uh, the Jesus and the writers of the New Testament focus on the obedience part, and uh, uh, sometimes it focuses on the faith part. But it, it's, it's always a both and. Those are two sides of, of the same coin, aren't they? Uh, for example, in Ephesians uh, chapter 2, we just, uh, it was read in church on Sunday, and the speaker spoke on that passage. Paul speaks about unbelievers as the sons and daughters of disobedience. Instead of saying they don't believe they're unbelievers, it's their sons and daughters of disobedience. Wow, they don't obey God. And so uh, that's something that we want to realize is how important the lifestyle of obedience is. And in fact, in Romans, Paul can put the obedience of faith. He puts those two together. Uh, so believing is entering also into a whole way of life. We are declared righteous so that we can obey God and please God for the first time. And uh, we have such an emphasis uh, in the West on uh, initial saving faith that uh, sometimes a person could be in Christ for several years before they finally realize, oh, I've been, uh, you know, saved, uh, re redeemed from uh, the penalty of sin that's been removed so that I could walk in obedience and please God and, and express faithfulness to Him. So it's always a both and. And so the moral exhortation part is really important uh, because it's saying, all right, now, uh, here's in particular now how uh, we express the, maybe the things I've been talking about or it might be new things or it might be problems in the life of the church, but here's what uh, obedient behavior looks like. Here's what a life of faithfulness looks like in Christ in light of the issues going on here. And for example, Yodia and Syntyche in Philippians 4 verses 2 and 3, uh, if these are two key leaders and two key women in the church and they're not getting along, that there's strife between them, that this is uh, a, a, not a sign of, obviously, of godly behavior, but of fleshliness. Paul chides the Corinthians for this, you may recall, in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, that they're fleshly or carnal because there's jealousy and strife among them. That's exhibit A. So that's why he addresses, and how embarrassing for these women, uh, but yet uh, how very important and a model for all the other leaders and, every, and everyone in the body is that we just can't have these long simmering difficulties in relationships. So uh, interesting, you know, sort of a approach that Paul takes. Okay, so read the whole letter, think in terms of paragraphs, know where you are in terms of just the epistolary structures, and then there's really room for some background reading. And uh, because epistles are so personal, in other words, there's an author who's writing, and there's a, a, a church or sometimes an individual that's receiving, and so the author's life setting and concerns and the recipient's life setting and concerns, both of those issues become immensely important to understand of the letter that, that bridges between those and ties those two together. And so, uh, as we've, we've talked about before, that uh, it's in epistles that you get the most payback for doing uh, historical background work. This is where it's golden. And this particular genre, more than any other genre, this is page 67, this is where you get the most help is in uh, the genre of epistles. So background uh, information is uh, highly, highly, highly significant in this genre. Now, let me just talk about um, a couple of books, three books on this. Uh, here's a new one, Dictionary of Paul and His Letters, again from the InterVarsity Press, uh, New Testament dictionaries. I passed this around last time, but the Dictionary of the Later New Testament and its development, this would be all of the other letters that aren't Paul's. Those would be covered. And then uh, a third resource, and this uh, um, might be uh, one that you're not particularly familiar with, is 
by George Kennedy, and uh, there was a George Kennedy that was in one of my favorite movies, Cool Hand Luke, and uh, he won an a award for the Best Supporting Actor. I don't think that's this George Kennedy. Okay, I think this is a different one. Uh, but this one uh, has been a lot of years at uh, uh, the University of North Carolina, professor of classics, and has written, uh, expert in rhetoric, and so has written a, a nice little book that's a good introduction, New Testament Interpretation Through Rhetorical Criticism. And this is a, an amazing thing that's kind of crossed over into biblical studies, both Old Testament and New Testament, of uh, using the, the categories and the, and the insight of ancient rhetoric to see how uh, the authors of the New Testament, of course, and Old Testament, uh, have, have used these categories. And, uh, for example, the Apostle Paul, he was trained as a rabbi. And uh, we know from... Uh, background studies that have done in Judaism that uh, the Hebrew rabbinical training early, early on, probably about 200 years or more before the coming of Christ, uh, they, they learned rhetoric from Aristotle and, you know, some of the other writers, Quintilian, all of that. So they, uh, they knew and studied as a part of their rabbinical training how to put together an argument. Now, rhetoric is about persuasion. <laughs> it's about how to put together a really good persuasive argument. And uh, so Paul, for example, would have learned this just as a part of his rabbinical training. Additionally, when Paul starts uh, and Barnabas go out as missionaries, and uh, if they do any public stuff like standing up by the gates of the city, which would be kind of the center of the city, you know, where everybody comes and all that, make public announcements. When he stands up there and begins to speak, he well better know something about rhetoric <laughs> because the people are used to having really good rhetoricians, be they, you know, traveling religious speakers or traveling philosophers or uh, somebody, you know, selling something or whatever, they know how to use rhetoric so that people would expect Paul and Barnabas and anybody else who's standing up to speak, they expect them to have some skill in this area. Now, Paul says to the Corinthians, I didn't emphasize on that, focus on that. I focus on Christ and Him crucified. So for them, because of the reading on the culture, he decided not to have a big emphasis on that, but he could have had that emphasis if he wanted it. But he knows how to put together a good argument. Uh, for, for example, in Galatians chapters 3 and 4, Paul puts together six arguments as to why Abraham is the father of these Gentile believers in Galatia. He's their father through faith, even though they haven't been circumcised and haven't, uh, you know, created uh, as close as they can get a Jewish sort of a birth. Uh, and so he has six arguments. Now, if you got six arguments, uh, what order do you put your arguments in, in terms of best, you know, to not quite as good to decent argument, but, you know, not your strong. So what order would you put them in? And, and the rhetoricians uh, discussed this and talked about this for centuries. So what do you think? What order do you put them in? You start with your best? No, you end with the best. All right. You don't start with your best. What's the problem if you start with your best? I mean, it's, it's, there's good things about it. If you start with your best... You really draw people in, don't you? Where do you lose them? <laughs> Your second point. <laughs> the second point. All right. Because you fired most of your powder at the very beginning, didn't you? And then it kind of all goes downhill from there. All right. So they determined you save your best until last. Because that's the one, frankly, that people remember the most, isn't it? So you want to end on a high note. You want to end, boom, with your strongest point. All right, okay, so now where, where do you start with then? Paul's got six 
pieces of information, where do you start? What, which one do you use? Which argument? Second best. Second best. They finally determined that. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? Start with a really good one. It's a good one. It will draw people in, but it, it may not be your best one. You're saving that to the end. And then you kind of tuck your other ones in, in the middle. And now to have six points of argumentation, that's a lot. Normally you might have three or four, most cases. But uh, in Galatians 3 and 4, Paul has six different arguments. And so he starts with his second best one in chapter 3. And this is a great argument because he asks the Galatians to testify. He asks about their experience. And he says, uh, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? Through doing works of law or, you know, through faith? So he's drawing them in, so they're thinking about their experience of when he was there, and they're saying, oh, well, we received the Spirit when we believed. So, see, they're testifying on behalf of his argument, see, from their own experience. That's a great way. And then he ends with this really, really interesting thing of, in uh, Galatians chapter 4, about Abraham had two sons, and he creates an allegory out of the historical thing uh, and apparently this was something his opponents had used ag against uh, the Galatians or to try to draw the Galatians in. And Paul takes their argument and absolutely turns it on its head and uh, uses it uh, to show actually Abraham's two sons and the inheritance through Isaac is not based on flesh, but it was based on spirit because Isaac had a supernatural birth. So it's really, really cool. So Paul clearly knew how to persuade people. And he wanted to do that, not in a manipulative way, but to the glory of God. And uh, I think this is something we need to do better at, learning how to persuade people. And uh, I'm looking at Tyler here. I think that's why people love to read C.S. Lewis, don't you? Because he was trained in rhetoric, wasn't he? The whole British uh, uh, school system, including all the parts of their, their empire, uh, well into the 20th century, rhetoric was the core of, of the, the educational program. And, uh, b but in recent years, we've gotten away from that. But boy, C.S. Lewis can put together an incredible argument, can't he? And there's lots of different kinds of proof and all that. So it's getting sensitized to that and aware of that to see how the author of epistles and uh, other parts of the scriptures, how they are trying to persuade us and trace the argument. Yes, yeah. I think just a comment on that. I mean, that was traditionally education was less about facts and more about how to uh, argue. How to think and argue, yes. Rhetorically persuade people. Yeah. So you would actually, and that's what, there's a resurgence of classical education now. Yes. Because they add those elements. Yes. Yes. Uh, rumor has it that uh, none of the folks that are trained in a rhetorical thing go into advertising. Because uh, <laughs> our advertising has moved away from giving facts and persuading people to buy a product to more of a emotivism, hasn't it? And, and you can have this tremendously emotional advertising, and you may not know what it's about till the very end. Oh, you know that you're emotionally engaged. And it has nothing to do with the product, but it has everything to do with stirring up your emotions and drawing you in. And then, oh, Lexus, oh, yeah, I'm going to go out and buy a $50,000 car. I'm so, <laughs> no, not me, just hypothetically somebody. Okay, so do the background work, do understand the culture and all of that, and uh, this is where it really pays off. Now, let's talk about uh, Philippians uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. Yeah, Annette. Could I just give a moment of testimony to yes. what you just said? Um, the first class I took here at Talbot was your New Testament class, and I had heard the book of Philippians preached and taught my whole life, but when you gave us that assignment... Um, to do a book chart on yes, Philippians? Philippians yes, Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Okay. And um, you gave us the article by Joseph Hellerman yes. on the background and history of right. the city of Philippi. And um, reading that background and learning more about the city of Philippi and the nature of everything that was in that environment and why Paul put that hymn specifically in that book. Yes. 
to them was life changing for me. Yes. And that was two years ago. Yeah. And that assignment is still changing my life today. Good. Wow. So, Good word. Yeah. It's, right. It was an incredible um, spotlight on that passage yes. for me that I had heard dozens of times. Yes. Well, thank you. You're absolutely right. And, and it, it is life changing, has been for me to do this, the background work too, and especially by folks that have done a lot of uh, working in, in, in the case of you know, Joe Hellerman, uh, he accessed uh, work that a German scholar was doing on inscriptions in ancient Philippi. And uh, be they burial uh, inscriptions on tombs or on uh, 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 ancient uh, you know, buildings that they've uncovered or uh, you know, statues or whatever that, you know, in stone that they uh, have uncovered. And studying those inscriptions gave great insight into the culture of, in this case, Philippi. And what's so important about that is that Philippi is in Macedonia. It's in northern Greece. And you'd expect it to be culturally a very Greek type city, but it's not. It's very Romanesque. It's the most Roman city in the whole eastern part of the Roman Empire. It was almost as Roman as Rome was. And uh, so many things that Paul says in Philippians relate to that, don't they? Many things. And to know that, it just kind of opens it up and you say, okay, there's nothing mystical about this letter, this language. It's, it's very specific to a very specific people in their life setting. And for us to do a little bit of work and understand that, then opens up the letter to us and to know how Paul expected them to apply it and how God expects us to apply it, understand it. So thank you, Nanette, that's it. Thank you, it's a good word. We all should say that about this. Okay, Philippians chapter 1. Here we go. In this letter, let me ask somebody to read this. I, I had Joe Hellerman actually uh, came into my office. We'd been in chapel together. We were talking, and so uh, he wanted to look at some stuff. Then we started talking, and I got disconnected. I was bringing all this other stuff to class, and I got disconnected from my Bible, which I'd taken to chapel. So I guess I shouldn't go to chapel. That's my application. <laughs> <laughs> Just teasing. All right. Oh, thank you. Okay. Here we go. We have the greeting. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. And wow, that's the only time I think he ever mentions uh, the, the two offices in the church when he's writing to one. That's, and, and so you'd want to say, gee, I wonder why he does that. That's, that's really unusual. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Two verses, okay? Pretty typical greeting except for the overseers and deacons. Here we go. You will see quite quickly why it's called the Thanksgiving section. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you all are partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Wow, what a beautiful introductory uh, thanksgiving to the letter, isn't it? Thank you. Okay, now, a good introduction um, connects with the hearers. It introduces them to the topic, 
and it uh, uh, hopefully excites a little bit of interest. Okay, that's a, a good introduction. We're told that you know to any talk or speech or sermon or whatever. So uh, I think Paul does uh, those three things uh, very well uh, in this. So let's kind of look at uh, the structure. Let's just break it down a little bit, and uh, and and see uh, what's going on. First of all, he thanks God for them in his prayers. Uh, well, let me back up. Who is likely reading this letter uh, in the Philippian house church or house churches, as if there's more than one? Who's reading this letter to them? An Possibly an elder, okay. Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus. yeah, Andrew. Uh, Epaphroditus is one of their own, and they had commissioned him uh, to take their uh, financial gift to Paul while Paul was uh, under house arrest in Rome. And so Epaphroditus had done that, and while he was there, or along the way, he got deathly sick and almost died. Uh, but he survived and got well, and so now apparently Paul has sent him and Timothy back uh, with this letter. And so he commends, in chapter 2, both Timothy and Epaphroditus. And uh, probably he spent a lot of time talking with both of them about uh, this letter and, and his intentions and why he's saying what he says. So that, as dear Epaphroditus reads it to the home folks, if they have questions and issues, ideally he can represent Paul, the author, and answer those. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very personal and, and, and uh, you know, very uh, thoughtful in that a letter represents someone's presence. And uh, a letter is short, you know, doesn't say everything, so what a bonus if, in fact, the, the messenger, the carrier of the letter, has been with the author and spent time with him, perhaps in this case weeks and months, and lots of hours talking about this, so that they are well equipped to answer questions and issues, representing Paul the author. So it's very personal, isn't it? It's beautiful. Yeah, Andrew. Yes? Are you saying that Timothy went with the right away? Apparently so. I think he's there with them. Yeah. Hope to send Timothy to you soon. Okay. And yeah. Again, yeah. Hope to send him just okay. So All right. Good. Thank you. So he's coming on his heels. Yeah, I was thinking it came, but he's coming on his heels. You're right. So he does. He does come in both of them, but Timothy's coming a little time later. He's still with Paul as long as Paul's under house arrest. But Paul's thinking that's going to end shortly, and probably the moment it ends, he probably will send Timothy because he didn't want to be alone. Don't blame him under house arrest. I mean, he's there with the Praetorian Guard all the time. But so good. Thank you, Andrew, for that clarification. So um, okay. So he starts with this remembrance of them with joy. And uh, what's interesting to see is verse five is this gives the reason or the cause underneath that joy, or that is giving expression to that joy. Uh, that is, uh, it's a causal statement. It's because of your partnering, Philippians, in the gospel. And so there's a couple of interesting things. The word partnering uh, or participation is uh, the Greek word koinonia. And we know that word, don't we? We normally use it in our churches for fellowship with one another. And... Uh, and so it can uh, mean fellowship, but uh, it, it can also have a financial connotation. Koinonia was used for partnering in business deals, in business relationships. So I would suggest uh, it does have a bit of a financial connotation here because of uh, Philippians 4, verses 10 through 20. This is when Paul thanks them for their financial gift to him. And he uses the word koinonia and some cognates of that uh, uh, several times, especially in verses 14 through 17. So again, this is introducing what he wants to talk about in the letter. And uh, a huge 
part of the letter is a thank you for their gift to him. And uh, so he introduces that. He is joyful and thankful for their koinonia, their fellowship. And in this case, it certainly includes financial partnering with him. But of course, it went beyond that. Obviously, if they're going to send a messenger with money, they're thinking about him, they're praying about him, they were concerned about him, they knew he was under house arrest. And so uh, after this uh, Thanksgiving section in 1, 3 through 11, the next section, uh, beginning in verses 12 up through 26, is he updates them on his situation just to take away that concern. Because they're sitting here wondering, what's going on with Paul? What's his situation? And so he just, it's kind of unusual in his letters. He updates them on that just to kind of emotionally help them to calm down and so they can hear the rest of the letter. Also what's interesting is uh, the phrase that they had partnering or koinonia in the gospel. Now we don't use that kind of language, do we? Because for us, the gospel is a message, isn't it? Something you proclaim. And uh, it's, it's unusual. Paul says they partnered in the gospel. So how do you think he's using gospel here? In ministry. In ministry, ministry uh, of the gospel, you mean? Okay. Or in his church planting efforts. Right? The financial partnership. Okay. Of, it looks like it uh, certainly encompasses the message of the gospel, but this is the whole program or plan of getting the gospel out, isn't it? So perhaps uh, a better word uh, that kind of captures Paul's nuance would be gospel hyphen cause, gospel cause, which is uh, you believe in the gospel and then you become a part of this movement or this plan of God promised through Abraham to bless all the people groups of the world and commissioned by Messiah Jesus now to go and make disciples of Jesus of all the people groups of the world. You believe in the gospel, the message, and then you become a part of this plan or program to get the message out. And uh, so uh, uh, Paul uses uh, the word gospel here numerous times, doesn't he? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times. Most of them is a noun, sometimes in, in a verbal form. And uh, so the gospel is something, he says, uh, can be advanced, his circumstances turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, that he wants them uh, to be worthy citizens of the gospel, in uh, chapter 1, verse 27, he says that uh, uh, Timothy has served me like a son serving his father uh, in the gospel. And, uh, and Iodia and Syntyche uh, had served in, in the gospel. And in 415, he says, at the first of the gospel, or the first proclamation of the gospel, when the gospel began there, the gospel program began there. So it's a whole sort of uh, idea of of believing in the message of the gospel and then being in the program and the plan of the gospel. Now we don't think that way or use that terminology and it's unfortunate, isn't it? Uh, and it's also interesting, our concept of koinonia or fellowship. Kind of see how far we've moved from what Paul is saying here. For most of us, Christian fellowship is, if I can use an analogy, it's the party after the game. You play a game, let's say a football game or a softball game or whatever, and afterwards then you have a party, you have fellowship. And uh, for a lot of uh, believers, the party is not after the game, but it, it is in lieu of the game, or it's instead of the game. Uh, but notice for Paul, uh, the fellowship of the koinonia uh, in, in that he's talking about here is what happens in the midst of the game. <laughs> in the midst of the gospel cause. Isn't that interesting? And these dear folks had endeared themselves to him. They really understood what was going on and they partnered with him, probably through their prayers, probably through their ministry, but uh, particularly through uh, their financial investment, okay? 
And so then verse 6, he says, I'm confident of this very thing that God who began a good work in you will complete it till the day of Christ Jesus. Okay? We're going to skip that for a moment. Then he goes on in verses 7 and 8 to talk about how they were partakers of grace with him. Now this phrase, partakers of grace, or the grace that was given to me, when Paul uses that, and here's some other passages, he uses that to refer to the Gentile mission. And uh, God's grace to me in that, uh, you know, he called me and sent me out as an apostle to the Gentiles. And so I think what he's talking about here is they had become partakers with him of that grace and being a part of that mission. Uh, and that engendered great affection. Someone read verses uh, 7 and 8 for us here. Listen to the strong words that he uses. Out loud would be nice, okay? <laughs> yes. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart. Since both in my imprisonment and the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for, for you uh, with the affection of you. All right. Wow, strong words. Long for you, affection, love, all this. So. Um, have you ever been on a mission trip with folks and done things with them and gone through some difficulties with them? Wow, that really knits your hearts together, doesn't it? Uh, I was uh, preaching on this passage in uh, a church in my area uh, a while back and uh, kind of emphasizing these things. And uh, right afterwards, an, an older gentleman came up to me and he had, he had tears in his eyes and he said, uh, I know what you're talking about, Walt. I've experienced that the last two years. He said, I've been a member of this church since it started, 25 years ago. And I've had fellowship with members of the church here for, for 25 years. You know, I've probably drunk a whole tanker car full of coffee with them. You know, I've eaten a whole, you know, box car of pie and cake with them. Uh, but what I have found is the last two years as I've gotten involved with the Gideons is that uh, serving with them has given me a more intense affection and commitment with these folks than 25 years of pie and coffee. Uh, and again, it's kind of the understanding that it's the fellowship of the koinonia in the game that, that really is so powerful. And he said, for example, recently we, and he named a local high school, we were standing across the street from that and handing out New Testaments. And uh, he said, we got an amazing variety of responses from students, but some of them were, were angry and uh, uh, cursed at us or spit at us or made obscene gestures at us. You know, a lot of them were nice, but some of them were really, really mean-spirited. And he said it was so humiliating to have a you know, 15 to 18 year old address, you know, someone in their late 60s or 70s that way. And, and he said, in the midst of feeling the pain of that, I'd look down the street and I'd see my fellow Gideons, you know, my brothers and sisters down there, and I'd look up the street and I'd see my fellow Gideons, and I know they were experiencing the same thing. And he said, that, that sort of ministry, kind of stepping out in faith for us, really knitted our hearts together with one another. And, and that's what happens, isn't it? And uh, as, as having been a missionary on support too, every month I would get my printout, I don't know if you've experienced this, missionaries, those who gave to us, and uh, I just thought, thank you for being partakers of grace. Wow, it just knit my hearts together with them through their financial involvement, making that, that ministry possible. So. All right, now at the end then, verses 9 through 11, his prayer gives way to petition. And this I pray. Now we shift from thanksgiving to petitioning the Lord for them. And he's petitioning the Lord. He wants their love to go to school. He wants it's they're doing well, they've been loving, but he wants their love to grow through real knowledge and all discernment. And uh, so that they can increasingly approve the things, literally the things that differ, or the things that really matter. And uh, that is the Christian life, isn't it? Early on, new Christian, it's learning the difference between, you know, bad and good. 
evil and you know godly okay but then later on it gets a little more sophisticated doesn't it now it's not just between bad and good but it's between bad and good and better and best <laughs> And uh, so the Philippians had done, made great choices, and Paul wants them to grow and be even more discerning so that their love, since it's a choice, is informed by real knowledge and all discernment so that they can choose the things that, that are best, are excellent, that are most important. Okay. Here's what I think is going on here. I think it's the big idea. To give thanks for their past partnership, their koinonia, in the gospel cause, I hyphenated it, and to petition God for even greater partnership in the future. Now again, I think this is the opening paragraph. This kind of sets the stage this, for the rest of the letter. It kind of lays out the big idea. Uh, and particularly in an opening paragraph like this, there's not going to be a lot of wandering around room. It's got to be tight and on point because you're, you're, you're setting up the rest of the things you're going to say and you want to orient the folks to that. Now, uh, the question is then, and remember, it's page 41, meaning comes from the top down. Uh, the question I want to ask you is, how does verse 6 fit into this? I'm confident of this, he who began a good work in you will complete that, bring that to completion or maturity in the day of Christ Jesus. How does verse uh, 6 fit into the, the flow of this very tight paragraph? What, uh, what is verse 6 about? Yeah, Andrew. Um, well, first off, it is about the sanctification. Yeah. That's the majority view, isn't it? You know, holy. And I guess as I, as I was studying the passage more, though, I think now it's about the Great Commission, actually. Is the answer to it. Like, yeah. They were the first, one of the first churches that partnered with Paul from the right. beginning. He said, he like, so I think maybe something yeah. about that is going to be completed. Okay, good. Good word. Let me, uh, let me just show you real quickly some things I noticed. Uh, Verse 5 gives a reason or cause for his joy. It's their koinonia in the gospel. Gospel is a key word. Uh, their partnership in the gospel cause seems to be connected to Paul's confidence in verse 6, as you were saying. There's something, there seems to be a connection there, and great affection results, and he, he petitions for their growth and knowledge so they can continue to make uh, really good choices. So the, the question then is, in verse 6, is the good work, and the majority view is their salvation or their sanctification, or is it uh, their partnership in the gospel cause? Uh, and, 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 and so that, that's kind of the, those are the, would be the two main options. There might be a, you know, a third thing, but those, those are the, 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 the two main ones. And, and so then the question is, if meaning comes from the top down, then uh, if this is about their partnering in the gospel cause in the present, in the past, in the future, and uh, Paul is certain of this, a good work, he's confident about it, that it's going to come to completion, is it the good work of their sanctification or their salvation or their partnering in the gospel cause? Those are, again, uh, now we just assume that it's, uh, it's their sanctification or salvation, don't we? We assume that. Um, there's several problems with that, though. Uh, let me just give you quickly some of my uh, reasoning here. Um, verse 6 is in the middle of a discussion about being partners in the gospel cause. Paul does not define it or describe the good work, so you would assume it fits intimately in the context, because he doesn't, he just says he doesn't give any setup or explanation of it. Uh, also, it's interesting, uh, it is a good work in you all, it's in the plural, or among you. Uh, so it seems to be a good work that involves, in this case, the whole church. Uh, third thing, uh, it will not come to completion or maturity until or at the day of Christ Jesus. So uh, it goes beyond uh, the believers, their death. If it's their sanctification, normally we assume that ends 
uh, when we're with the Lord, and it's very much better, he says later on in 121, that uh, this is, um, uh, if it's about sanctification, that is not ongoing until the day of Christ Jesus, or until Christ returns. Uh, a fourth point here, he's writing them uh, to thank them for their partnership in the gospel. So it, it makes sense that, and that's in verse five, in verse six, he's confident of the fruitfulness of their partnership in the gospel. And that verse six, uh, uh, I would suggest is uh, about their partnership in the gospel coming to fruition in the day of Christ Jesus. And he unpacks that in chapter four, verses 14 through 17 that uh, they have made an investment and, uh, and, and, and it's going to, to grow to maturity in Christ. So I, I think the good work is God began it, initiated it, they responded, and they have, have continued in partnering in that through their giving. And that investment is going to keep growing and growing and growing and growing until Christ returns and then they will see it in its maturity, its fullness, in the day of Christ Jesus. Now think about it. This is the only church, as far as we know, that invested in the Apostle Paul's ministry. Isn't that amazing? Wouldn't you like to get in on that investment, spiritually? <laughs> the only better one would be to invest in Jesus' ministry, like those dear ladies in Luke 8, 1, 2, 3 did. <laughs> That's the only better investment, spiritually. So again, I think scripture, folks, is, is real, uh, real spiritual specific, and it isn't general, but it's, it's real specific. Now, here we go. We have this pretty tightly argued paragraph. Is it possible that in the middle of it, Paul makes a broad, expansive statement about their sanctification or their salvation? Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. That is possible, certainly. That's not the best question, though. Is it probable? And I would say it's not as probable <laughs> in this tightly reasoned discussion, introducing the whole letter about which he's going to thank them for their partnership, it's far more probable that the good work is what the rest of the paragraph is about, their partnering in the gospel cause. Meaning comes from the top down, from the larger units down to the smaller. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.